Um, let's try to deal with the China question, since it was the question at lunch, it seems to be on, on quite a lot of people's minds. Monsieur Vadrine, do you think that Enrico kind of laid it out in fairly stark terms. I mean, do you think Europe really does have to choose somehow between the US and China, or is this a false choice, do you think? Ben, dans l'idéal, <coughs> l'Europe ne devrait pas avoir à choisir. L'Europe devrait avoir sa position. Et, et selon les sujets, elle serait d'accord ou pas avec les États-Unis, mais d'accord ou pas avec la Chine. Elle pourrait même jouer un rôle constructif sur les, sur les nouvelles règles de la mondialisation qu'il faut encadrer un peu plus. Mais ça suppose que l'Europe ait sa propre position. Donc si elle n'arrive pas à avoir sa propre position, elle sera en effet condamnée à choisir ou à subir en matière de technologie. Donc c'est très important que les Européens arrivent à définir une vision commune. Ça suppose d'avoir la même évaluation, ce qui n'est pas évident du problème que représente la Chine. Est-ce que c'est un problème Est-ce que c'est une menace Est-ce que c'est une opportunité Est-ce que c'est juste un partenariat plus gros que les autres Déjà, il n'y a pas tout à fait accord au niveau de l'évaluation et du diagnostic. Si on arrivait à ça, si on avait quelques positions communes et quelques priorités en tant qu'Européens, il est évident que quasiment du jour au lendemain, on trouverait sur ce point particulier une vraie puissance. Il faudrait euh, utiliser intelligemment, parce que quand on parle d'Europe puissance, un thème qui se développe enfin, il s'agit d'une puissance raisonnable, bien sûr, rationnelle, etc. Enfin, et ça commence donc par un effort entre Européens sur euh, l'évaluation exacte, ce qui n'est pas encore fait. Oui, ouais, exactement. Would others like to come in on this question? Fol Anna, then um, Fulker. Uh, in uh, the 10 points highlighted by, by uh, Kevin lunchtime, from Xi Jinping perspective, the 10th is our priority as Westerners and in particular as Europeans. And I would say as, uh, as Europeans, because our strength, I mean, we are, back, we are not any longer on this idea of the soft power and the 21st century being <laughs> the mean being the, the, the era or the, down, the, the beginning of the era of law, but we are wired in legal terms. We are wired in institutional terms, which means that, th that I absolutely agree with Kevin. Uh, the, I mean, the position of China is to infuse new values to the existing framework, not to shake it, as Russia has tried to do sometimes, but in the end, sharing the, the, core, the core issues and bringing into a legal Western approach, rational context, uh, concepts like harmony. Ha, huh, okay, you know, it's, we have to understand this and to, to just be very clear about what this means. It's not just a nice word put into, and I, I'm taking just one example. So, yeah. I think that for us, this idea of, of power, and it was very interesting, this, this idea that this privacy or ownership of data, we bet on the citizens. We have millions or billions of allies that are concerned that they, their data, we need to be, uh, I mean, to be consequent, to, to, to be, I mean, to have, to get the consequences of what we mean. And what and stand by them, yeah. and just on this issue of China, counter this subtle idea because when they establish other institutions, okay, you see that, but when they come and they infuse different uh, concepts, values, principles in the existing institutions, this is not perceived. Right, Volker. Well, please. Steve, I think if we were to accept this binary choice. Mm -hmm. That we had, if we were to accept that we have to choose the one side or the other, we would already have lost. We would have lost our whatever aspiration of some form, any form of strategic autonomy or European sovereignty or whatever you call it. And 
Therefore, I think we, we simply must not accept it and, and lay out, and I think we have good reasons and good arguments and good instruments to lay out that there are alternatives. Of course, China is a competitor. Um, but the question is, how do you compete? I mean, do you, do you simply geopoliticize uh, and militarize competition? Or do you say it is competition over a whole range of policy issues, which includes that you cooperate on some issues where you have a common interest, climate change, for example, but you compete over technology or you compete over social models. And I think the European Commission got it right in that strategic paper which it issued earlier that year and which probably doesn't have a 100% consensus in Europe, but a very, very wide-ranging consensus where they actually split sort of the policy fields and said, yes, China is an economic partner. China is a partner on some global affairs like working on climate change. China is also a technological competitor, no doubts about it, and what probably didn't go down too well in Beijing, uh, China is a systemic rival yes. when it comes to issues of governance. I think saying that clearly and making sure that being a systemic rival would not keep us from cooperating on climate change. I mean, why should we sort of give up, cooperate on, on, on issues of mankind because we have a competition yeah. about models of governance? That is the way Europe has to go if it wants to assert itself. And my last point, we are not alone here. I mean, go to Southeast Asia, go to India, go to Latin America, and I guess there are a lot of, a lot of actors there. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's the young people who, who would like to have Huawei and Apple, or Apple with Chinese characteristics. It's also a lot of elites who would like to have American arms with China's, finance, Chinese financing, sure. if that was possible. I mean, no one wants to choose. So why should we be pushed into that binary sure. choice just by the US and China? Good, because I mean, sometimes what worries me is we're, I mean, Long time ago, I wrote a piece called Needing an Enemy and Finding China. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this great risk of creating something that doesn't have to be there. And if you're thinking about climate change, I mean, China is now responsible for 40% of, of CO2. I mean, people in Europe could heat their coffee by blowing on it, and it would make almost no difference to the fate of the planet. So dealing with China on these things, India matters terribly. Enrico, sorry, please. Just one point about the fact that this binary choice, in my, for my thought, uh, <coughs> is the consequence of 28 Brexit. Interesting. In case of 28 Brexit, each country has only a binary choice, to be a colony of the US or a colony of China. Being together, we can avoid the choice we can, we, because we can be at the same level on many uh, issues. We can take the leadership of some of these issues and we have to change our narrative on, on Europe on that because our narrative is still on some issues the same narrative of the 60s and, and the 70s, the, the Cold War narrative about peace, stability and so on. That is no more, I think, the narrative with which you, you can deal with young people and, and the new generation. We have to clearly tell them there are issues where we can take the leadership only if we are united. If, if not, it's impossible to take this leadership. And at the end of the day, the choice for all the different member states will be to uh, be closer to the one or, or, or to other one. This is why. At the end of the day, I think uh, our choice is, is a very political choice. And it's a political choice in terms of, so of, of delivery. Because we, if we are not able to deliver yes. on some of, this, of these issues, it's, it's quite impossible. And for instance, on many of these issues, delivery means also the way in which we decided to, um, uh, to take decisions. For instance, I am in that period, I know it's, it's very difficult to say, I know it's, uh, it's very divisive, but we can't continue thinking that we have on all the different issues mm -hmm. to be at 28 right. or, or at 27. Right. I am a big fan of considering that two speeds Europe is a was a success on many issues, uh, Euro and Schengen, two successes to two speeds Europe, so it is not a blasphemy to say two speeds Europe on some uh, uh, subjects. We have to be, but we have to be very, very 
concrete, effective, and saying that we need delivery. If we continue to be too orthodox, saying that we can't have two speeds Europe because it is um, heterodox, no. at the end of the day, citizens will not be happy no. of the decisions and they will decide to vote for Le Pen or for Salvini right. or, or right. whatever. So yeah. it's a problem of delivery, of how to be effective in our okay. decisions. In some way, some decisions, we have to take these decisions out of the treaties. I, right. I'm, 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 I'm very, I know it's a sort of blasphemy, mm -hmm. but ESM, the ESM was a decision taken outside the treaties because it was necessary in one night to take a decision. And yeah. the European Union needs to give, to, to give the citizens the idea that we can protect them because we, can, we are able to decide and not to just to wait because of treaties, difficulties, unanimous decisions, and, right. and so on and Thank so forth. You. Well, blasphemy is good here, I, I think. Um, I'd actually want to ask Artyom a question, if, if I may, and, and then, Michael, I'll come to you. Artyom, do you think Russia's kind of new, what we call this, what Kevin called a strategic condominium with China, is this tactical or strategic? I mean, is it out of current sense of weakness, or is it some, I talked to Alexander Dugan the other day, believe it or not, sort of slightly mad theorist of Eurasia, and I can't tell how seriously anyone takes this in Russia. So do you think maybe Russia bends too far toward China? Yeah. And is it tactical, or is it a long-term partnership, do you think? Look, I guess uh, in this kind of condominium, only you, the Europeans, you believe in this condominium. We don't, okay. since uh, we are much closer to China. And uh, even us, we don't know China to be good predictors, to have uh, really uh, adequate forecasts. If you look, you and us, uh, the Russians, we overlooked all dramatic changes through the post-Second World War history of China. It shows how we understand. And this perfect report, this perfect sketch of uh, Prime Minister Rudd shows to what extent of understanding of China we are. Not upon any other country we can imagine such a speech, brilliant speech, at a launch, just general day, uh, day main, uh, grand lines of the French foreign policy, or German, or Austrian, or even Russian. It shows that our understanding of China is still tremendously sufficient. We talk about binary choice, but whether Chinese do choose in the same way, they have India, they have Southeast Asia, they have many times more developed relations with United States. They have a, their African policy. They've been overlooked by everyone, by the Europeans, by the Russians, by the Americans. And I guess our point of view upon the China here from Europe or from Moscow, I guess for the Chinese it's still the same Europe. It's, it's inadequate. And I guess, um, here about condominium, where it's condominium? In Central Asia, in the Caucasus, over Mongolia, I see no space for this condominium. Relations with China, to my mind, they're going to be much more complex, not European or Euro-Atlantic style. It's, from, it's one point and another. We still have to understand what is driving force for the Chinese economic growth and when and because of what it can stop potentially. Put and since we overlooked yeah. so many changes mm -hmm. in uh, Chinese developments, I guess probably we also overlook the uh, margins, the barriers, let's say, the constraints of this economic growth. And if there are some of uh, these constraints, it ruins the, 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 the whole picture, uh, this very uh, frightening picture of nowadays uh, China and its okay. relations to the rest of the world. Thank you. Michael, please. I'm a bit puzzled by this. I think you've said it twice now. What do you call the binary choice? 
uh, of the decision on Brexit between China on the one hand and America on the other. Because if you came to London or anywhere in the United Kingdom and you said that was your view of what Brexit was about, they'd look at you in total confusion. Because if that was the question, the British would vote for neither. The whole point about Brexit was to give ourselves more room for manoeuvring without being tied to major blocks. So I think if you say that this is the question that Europe has got to take into account, I would say to you that is not a valid question. Uh, we, we genuinely, uh, somebody said to me, why have you always appeared to be anti-European? My answer has always been, we're not anti-European, we're part of Europe. We've always been part of Europe, our history is European. We are anti-overdone -over bureaucracy. And if you want to see in the world the best example I can think of of an over overdone bureaucracy, you find it in Brussels. And the feeling in Britain was that to be told you could do certain things, you could eat certain things, or you could dress in a certain way was a decision for Europe, was something that got under their skin. When you say, why did they vote the way they did? In a sense, they were blaming the British politi politicians for not talking to them. It's only now, after the referendum is over, we're discovering, had we gone down and talked to them, we might have discovered a lot of these things earlier. Precisely. Enrique, do you want to answer quickly? No, ju no? just okay. to say that mm -hmm. uh, my point is not that this is the discussion about the referendum. My point is that will be the consequence in 10 years' time. In 10 years' time, with separation, with split of Europe, each country in 10 years' time, not today, will have only to decide whether to be an American colony or a Chinese colony with the split of the European Union. Well, uh, that, that is my point. I mean, Maybe I'm wrong. Enough. Maybe I, yeah. I can't see yeah. with the evolution, demographic, uh, in terms of economic power, the possibility of any of the European country to be able to deal alone with China or with the US. The only possibility to stand all together. Okay. And this is why Carl. I think for, for, for the UK it will be a problem. Not today, I'm sure, and I know very well that the debate was on other uh, issues. I, I no, that's fine. I mean, one this sentence. is all understood. Michael, Anna, okay, Lord very quickly. I mean, honestly, you have explained the divide between the elite and the people. I mean, what you are saying on the, on the Brussels being the big bureaucratic, it's what the elite in your country has been. This has been the anthem of your elite. So, I mean, I think that you as an elite, you should revise what you have been telling and what this idea of not having the, the right, I mean, being forbidden to have coffee ba or tea bags, not coffee, I mean, mind you, not coffee, tea bags, or this kind of thing. I mean, this is not the reality. We are not going to discuss bureaucracy in Brussels and its excesses, but I think that there you have, I mean, honestly, you as elite, you, you have to look at yourself. It's not that we do not have to do it in other countries, but frankly, on the Brexit issue, I had to say that. Okay, um, well done. Let's actually not keep going too much on Brexit because, act, I mean, we're in a kind of interesting moment where things might get resolved nicely. I suspect my own guess is there'll be a technical extension and um, for not very long, because one of the things quite clear to me is Boris Johnson would like it done before he has an election, which he also needs. But, you know, everybody's got their own views. And um, Minister Vidrine makes his apologies. He had an appointment he couldn't avoid, and we got started a bit late. So I just wanted to express to you from him his um, deep regrets for having to leave early. So we still have about half an hour. I'd like to, given Poland, I'd love to talk a little bit about Hungary, Poland, rule of law. Um, you, you know, this is one of the great, you know, perhaps it's tied to the migration issue, it's tied to the identity issue, it's tied to lots of things, but can Europe at 28, 27, can Europe deal with this question? What are the instruments? Can it do better? Or is it better to somehow rethink the idea of what European federalism is 
to allow for more sovereignty, which might have kept Britain in the European Union had it been done earlier. So would, would anyone like to um, deal with this question? I, so, and Michael, why I don't you start, start I since speak, I cut you off before, I apologize. I can only speak for myself, but I voted to leave because after 40 years of being told that Europe was going to reform, I got fed up with waiting for it. <laughs> but had somebody come along with a proper reform proposed, which would have given less power to Brussels and more power to the individual nations and their peoples, I would probably have supported that. De Gaulle used to speak of the Europe des patries, the Europe des nations. I was a fervent European in those days. But I, I am a fan of Jacques Delors' brand, uh, uh, Fédération d'État Nation, mm -hmm. uh, because I think it was a, a good synthesis. My point, and I continue on the blasphemy uh, mood, my point is that, for instance, on migrations and in the relationship with Visegrad countries, frankly speaking, we can't think we will have any positive and concrete effective solution having Orban at the table with the veto right. This is my point. If someone is, is, con is convincing on, on, on this point, I'm, I would be more than happy. But I think it's very complicated. So, for instance, on these topics, we need to have another treaty, a treaty outside of uh, EU treaties, signed by willing countries without Hungary or without Poland, I don't know who, who, the, other, the, the other Visegrad countries' position, but with the idea to have uh, a treaty with tools, uh, with relocation uh, framework, with meanings, and with rules, and with the majority rule to decide. Mm -hmm. Until now, we had evolutions in the, uh, on this topic, and at the end of the day, they are ineffective. They are not working. So right. uh, my point is that if we continue allowing those countries to stop the decisions of the others, it will be a problem for us, and it will be an European Union non-effective. So it is just one example. Sure. But just to tell you that at the end of the day, I, I think it's the only way to be uh, very assertive and to be also uh, clear with them. I know that there's a big difference between the funding members of the European Union and Visegrad countries in terms of demographics. Uh, funding members of the European Union, we used to be around 10% of our population is uh, from an immigrant uh, uh, origin, around 10%. Less, more, but it is around 10%. In, in, if I'm not wrong, in Poland, Hungary, these figures are 99 versus 1%. And the 1% is, is not coming from Africa or from Latin America. It's coming from the rest of uh, Central Europe. So at the end of the day, there's a, a very big point of uh, starting that is so different. Right. This is why I say we can't wait. We have to have new tools and we have to mm -hmm. decide. So this okay. new treaty for me is one of the urgencies of Great. this new formation, of this thank, new uh, political you. legislature. So it, is, it is worth saying, by the way, that Poland has many more immigrants than you imagine, but most yeah. of them are Ukrainian. Ukrainian, yeah. Um, so we, Anna and yeah, then Volker. Honestly, I agree with Enrico, and I think that the only way forward is a geography variable, so distinct groupings in distinct issues. The problem we have here is not migration. I think that what you were referring is more uh, the principles and values that are enshrined in Article 2 of the treaty. And in particular, let me say, independence of the justice, of the judiciary system, independence of justice. And this is something that we have to rethink. And maybe, you know what, diminish the, the area where we have judicial cooperation. This is something that we will have to address with open eyes. I think that the days have changed, and you know what? It could be done. We, we, we could go um, shrinking, and it, would not, it should not be perceived, and I think that we can explain to our, it to our population. So absolutely clear in new areas, we can adjust the 28, that's, 
And Schengen and the, the, the Euro are good examples of things that Schengen is clear, it was thought outside and then it was incorporated. And this incorporation probably should be revisited. And we have to do it, we have to do it. Uh, this is my perspective because the rule of law is also changing because the law is changing. I mean, we have to defend it in this context of China of just weakening of the value of the law of other instruments, mm -hmm. uh, international treaties. Paris is not legally binding. This is a new system and we need to understand that in cooperation and I'm a died in the wool uh, lawyer, European continental lawyer. But you know, you have, we have to be realistic. And in, sure. in terms of European Union, let's rethink certain sensitive areas. Okay, Poland, you don't want, okay, then you don't, you are not in the Schengen area. You are not in the cooperation, in the, judi in the judicial cooperation. And we negotiate and we decide the alternative. Do these reforms to have an independent justice. Okay, Volker, please. Well, three short points, one, one I think on on Europe being so unreformable, that's a little bit of a, of a myth which, which probably helped to, to win the Brexit referendum in Britain. But I think the British Prime Minister at that time, David Cameron, was the one who proved that you can renegotiate a couple of important issues, like the question of uh, sort of social benefits to, to, to immigrants and their children who live in other countries. Uh, Cameron, he had a sound argument and he got the consensus from the others, so things could be changed. And uh, that is what happens. I mean, it's a living body and, and the European Union is always a work in progress and things do change. And the bureaucracy in Brussels is not much bigger than that of a big city in, in Europe, actually. I, mean, I, I remember a Canadian friend once coming and saying, well, we are so envious that you are having something like Brussels because it means that your nation states don't have to have all this trade bureaucracy 27 or 28 times. So I guess you would have a little bit more bureaucracy in Britain after Brexit because you need your own trade negotiators now, rather than sourcing that out to Brussels, who is doing it in the common European interest. But more importantly, I think on the other issues, either we actually have, as uh, the letter says, and Anna said, either we have a, a, a sort of flexible geography, or we have qualified majority voting on more things, including foreign policy. And I think both would be a way to overcome this embarrassing situation that in the UN or in the Human Rights Council, uh, we have a statement read by one European Council for 26 or for 27 out of 28. Uh, the UK is always with the majority here. Uh, and then of Hungary or Greece uh, saying, oh, we cannot share that because it is against China. So, so why not have qualitative majority voting also on foreign policy issues? I think that would be the way forward. And sort of the dialectic conclusion of that is, I mean, we complain so much about people saying that elites don't listen to them. But here we have something. If we would go forward with a stronger foreign policy, where the majority of the people in Europe, and we know that from opinion polls all over the place, would be with us. The one thing where people want more integration is foreign policy and security policy. Mm -hmm. They don't want it in cultural policies. They don't want it in social policies necessarily. But foreign policy, security, they do all want more integrated Europe. Great. Um, I would like, I've got one more question and I'd like to go then to the audience. So please think of some questions you might have for yeah. our panel. Ar Artem, did you Just to comment a little bit upon uh, Poland. I, I guess, I'll, I'll tell you just a, a short anecdote. A, a friend of mine from Italy once, it was before 2004, uh, he said, look, uh, it was a talk between two Italians. Look, the Poles going to join e e EU. And another one, he commented, yeah, the Poles is such Russians, those who write in, in, in Latin alphabet. And uh, you should understand the difference between uh, these parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they don't feel responsibility for the migrants that are not theirs. Yes. They don't feel responsibility for these regions. They never had in common with the Middle East or Africa. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Do believe me, I, I, I can tell this because my children, they're 50% Polish and I speak Polish. Uh, 
inside the countries, I say, in the West, in absolutely Russian meaning, mm -hmm. in your part of mm -hmm. Europe, most of you from the Western part of Europe. It, it, in, that is why they need much more time to get used to this solidarity. Probably uh, Germany has not so much in common with Middle East as France, as Italy, as Britain, but you already got used to this kind of sovereignty and uh, to this kind of solidarity and joint mm -hmm. common responsibility. Mm -hmm. The Poles, they didn't use. Yes. But at the same time, they consider as ours, them, uh, those who come from, let us say, even from the Caucasus, yes. from Central Asia, since it's not something alien, they simply have their, in their family histories, family memory that, okay, we had a Polish origin governor mm -hmm. in Georgia. By the way, his great grandson, he's a professor of our university, Professor Baranowski. Yeah. So it's another history. Yeah. And you could not force them. I yes. don't, I'm not such a specialist. No, 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 no. It, it's good. good. I mean, and also let me just add one sentence. I mean, one forgets, I mean, and you don't mind if I say this, under Soviet Union, they were under a bell jar for 70 years. There was no immigration and emigration under the Soviet Union in, from Poland. I mean, maybe you could emigrate a bit, but there was no immigration much. So it's all a bit of a shock, I, I think. And, and it does feed people who want to play on fears of identity and what's happening to the family and all the rest of it.